And now, weighing in out of the blue corner, Josh the Pong Thompson. 100% agree. And on the other mic, he weighs in from the red corner, Big John McCarthy. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Weighing In Podcast, where my man, the punk Josh Thompson, is ready to dispose of all kinds of information yes. that we know is going on. There's all kinds of things to talk about. There's a couple of good fights coming up, but there's also things just happening within the sport of MMA as far as rules and regulations oh. and everything's changing all of a sudden. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah craziness oh you know we were talking about yes uh the last night yes, the other show last show we were talking about a couple things we talked about how thick my neck was which you know yes, and, but i forgot to i forgot to tell people that back in the day when you're the picture or image or whatever you were talking about uh when you're watching one of my old fights with Hermes franca yeah. my neck back then was about 18 inches yeah i believe it i had a really thick neck now it's probably closer to like 16 i lost a good yes. two inches around my neck you- Trust me, you lost more than two inches. Wow. <laughs> two inches is a lot, though. Just ask, dude, just ask her. Dude. She'll tell you. Dude, what are you talking <laughs> about? I'm, I'm, I'm down more than that, so that's all right. That's oh, all man. Right. It's crazy. Like, I was actually, because you brought that up, I actually went back and looked at some old photos online. I'm like, damn, you used, to, you used to have traps, a little bit of traps. You used to have a yeah. neck, and it was just like, yeah. And then... Yeah. yeah. It all went away, man. Then, it all went away. <laughs> it all went away. Hey, um, but you did say, you know, there was a lot of things that we talked about on the last show, and there's a lot of things. Uh, you know, but I wanted to hit the I want to hit the comment section a little bit on our YouTube. Man, you guys okay. look, let's just go ahead and bring it out. You guys keep it positive, man. Keep it positive because I, I'm, a, know, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm sometimes I feel like I gotta come in there and just roast you guys. Like I did some I did some of you guys today. I just roasted you guys. It was so great. If you guys haven't hit the comment section on our last show, hit the comment section, hit a little thumbs up. I like everyone's comments when I roast them. It doesn't matter whether I don't normally like put a thumbs down. I just normally just roast them and just have fun with it with a big smiley face and maybe, maybe some like nerd glasses and maybe some sunglasses, depending. Sometimes I'll go like hashtag thug life with the sunglasses, you know, a little bit of Tupac in there. But uh, there. yeah, I just love when people go hard in the paint on somebody. Like they were going hard on the paint against like on me and somewhat on you too, because we apparently didn't know or we forgot. Okay. I completely spaced it. Didn't even think about it. Is that Randy Brown has already fought Jack Della Madalena and he also lost. Yeah. What I loved yes. was how hard in the paint that they people yelled at us in there saying, man, he's already been knocked out. He's already been knocked. He got knocked the fuck out. He got knocked out. He's been, he got slept, bro. He got submitted guys he got <laughs> submitted you guys were calling me stupid calling me dumb you dummy you don't even know this sport. i can't even watch this channel anymore i love it i can't even watch a bunch of karens can't even watch this channel anymore he's already been knocked out by him he's already been knocked out no he got submitted guys he got submitted so that's i just wanted that i want to get down on the front because man it was i was having fun with some people today because you guys have all the time in the world after you listen to our show to look things up and then oh, yeah. actually then they even verify it but yet you still can't even get it right before you go on to someone else's channel and talk shit. And I thought it was kind of fun. So I had some fun today. I had some fun today, John. I went hard. I didn't go hard in the paint, but I was giggling the whole time. I laughed. Like, I don't think like a lot of you guys, you want to know how I know a lot of you guys are casuals. The guys that talk trash in the YouTube section is because our numbers go down when it's not a pay-per-view, which means you guys don't watch any, any of the shows unless it's the pay-per-view and you randomly will click on something probably, but the numbers go down. And, but then you guys don't really talk about, like, you don't really come at us during the other times. So I, I just laugh because the numbers are down during the non pay per view weeks. You guys come back, you're sparking back around around the pay per view times. It's just great, though. I love it. I love it. But it, it's fun. I got to have fun with them, John, because sometimes I do get bored at home. Kids are at school and, you know, and, you know, they don't have time to be bored. I, I, don't, I, have know, time, I don't have time to look at the comments. Exactly. You, and I'm building my damn house. And so I'm busy the entire you, day from morning doing chores with animals <laughs> to getting into the house and doing work. And then 4 30 yeah. back to the animals. It's like, I'm done. You don't even have time to read Dave's texts to even know that Dave. No, I see. I did it. <laughs> okay. It's like you said. It's like, it's like sorry. Oh, uh, I'm a, I'm a can't horrible follow human instructions. Being. Can't, can't even follow, can't even follow instructions. Can't even read a damn text that poor well, podcast Dave took Josh the time 
to send to me and never saw it. The if you guys are wondering why Dave sounds like shit, that's how Horrible. he normally sounds. We just uh, took away his mic, so now he's working. No, he's in California, uh, weathering the storm. I guess we could say uh, Dude. huge windstorm out. There. Hey, big storm. I don't know if my flight was gonna. I land. I swear mm-hmm. to God, it was like so bumpy, and uh, you could hear the wind pelting, and you could feel the plane getting pulled back. Oh, dude, it was so scary. Like man, yeah. I was so worried for it. Was so scary. Uh, and then, and then, so, so, and then, and then, take Bay Area traffic, right? Uh, Blow out all the traffic lights so they're not working, and now you yeah, everybody has oh, to do that one stop four four way intersections, one stop uh, go, one stop go, dude. Do that in the Bay Area. Uh, and you will you will quickly want to move get back to Texas as fast as possible. No, no, no. As soon as you <laughs> land, you should just want to get back to Texas, buddy. That's true too. Like when you fly into San Jose, you fly over what I call like I was in South Africa for a bit, and you fly when you fly into South Africa into Cape Town, you fly over this thing called like a shanty town. Which shanty is, town. Yeah, basically like a little bit of a it's like a town made from like mud and cardboard boxes and all the other stuff. And um that's kind of how that's kind of how San Jose is now. There's a full, there's a park directly under, like right below where people fly in, in San Jose airport. And it's just basically the whole, the whole, um, that whole little park. It's all been taken over basketball courts, baseball fields, soccer fields, all been taken over by uh, homeless. And so you can actually see if you fly in at night, you'll see people like fires going and, um, the fires going. And when the fires are going, is that my phone? I don't okay. Hear it. So you'll feel that again. I never, I never answered Dave's text. Either. <laughs> you'll see fires going. <laughs> you'll see fires going uh, when you fly in, and yeah, it's just one of those things, man. It's such a beautiful state, and it could be so amazing. But, 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 but. Anyways, we're not going to go off on that tangent. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and stick with the with the sport of the day. <laughs> sure, but John. <laughs> There yes. was something else I wanted to bring up from the last show. I wanted to just bring it all out. Look, there was a there was uh the whole talk with the Dustin Poirier fight in the situation with um with uh Saint Denis contract Saint-Denis. and the whole deal. Okay. I want you guys to understand this though. If you guys are at home and you guys are you guys obviously enjoy watching Dustin fight, you guys enjoy watching Saint Denis fight, you guys obviously enjoy listening to our podcast, even when you don't like what we say, you still listen, and I like that. I appreciate that. Okay, make sure you guys thank us in the comments. I like all the thank yous we get this show. I, mean, I know you guys are paying attention and listening. Thank you guys so much. Um, but also hit the subscribe button too while you guys are at it. You know, pound that there subscribe button. That's a good idea. Bell notifications, thumbs up, love it. Um, but I wanted to say this. <clears throat> when people were complaining, and John, maybe you can back me up on this, and I was actually talking to a couple managers earlier today to kind of go over this. When... Fights when fighters want to be put together in, in a car, Saint Denise versus Dustin Poirier. I think there's a disconnect a little bit because I was reading some of the fans in the comments. I was also le- looking at some of the the media, and the conversation was this: the UFC does this all the time. They basically announce fights before the fight is uh, signed. Even if they okay. do, John. Even if they do, which I think that they do. Okay. At times. Yes. But I want to say this. But hold on. <clears throat> Understand. The reason that they do is because they've given a, a verbal. Thank you. From the fight. Thank you. Or from the management. So I can go a step further than that. What exactly are you negotiating when it's the fight? You're not on a fight by fight basis, you have a contract. That says what you're making. So what are we really arguing? Look, let's just set it in stone. You get this many rooms. You get this much per diem. You get this much for your corner. You, your contract is already set. You're going to fight for this and you're going to fight for this if you win. That's what you get. So and let, it's basically like, hey, we're thinking we're going to have you St. Denise. Do you want to fight St. Denise? The verbal was yes. I have that as a written. That's basically a verbal agreement. That's yeah. you can That can be held up in court. If I was to say, hey, <laughs> tell, am I wrong or am I right? I mean, no, I'm you, sure there's a lot. Obviously, what, you could fight it. A bunch what of you're right ways, is, but yes, you're, they're never going to be able to make you fight under no. that. But what what that verbal is, is it gives them as a promotion the right to start promoting something you've agreed to. So the, that's just the way it and is. And look, and I, I love Dustin and I'm looking forward to this fight with St. Denise. But the bottom line is. They, if they did do it before they got the agreement from both, then I understand where you're coming from. But realistically, the bottom, the other, the biggest part of it all is, what are you really negotiating? 
Well, they're, honestly, the only thing that the one thing that I know people used to negotiate with the UFC was number of tickets, how many tickets they would be able to get for family members, friends, where those tickets would be at. That was something that I knew people would negotiate that before saying they would accept the fight. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Money's money's not because that's already written out there. And when you have your four fight, six fight, eight fight contract, depending upon what it is. Yeah. A lot of fighters will say, Hey, I want 10 tickets and I want, you know, it's like, it just depends on what they want. It's not just tickets. It could be uh, flights. I want two extra flights. Yeah. I want a couple of different hotel rooms. You know, whatever it is, you know, I want one for my wife, one for my side piece. That's kind of, you know, they want to kind of make sure they organize that all as they go there. So, I mean, <clears throat> you, the history of, and, and even Dana talked about when Justin Gaethje was fighting Habib in, uh, on Fight Island. I, I believe it was Fight Island. And he goes, hey, he goes, Justin was probably the only fighter that we've ever had. They didn't say, yeah, I'm going to be on that card. I want you to put this guy, my friend, on the same card. I want I want like 50 tickets, you know, for my family and my friends. He said, all I want is my mom and dad to be there. That was it. He said, I, just, I want to fight for the title with my mom and dad there. He, and even Dana came out and said, like, that's one of the most easiest things that I could have ever done for that young man. You know what I'm saying? Like, just fighters in general to have a tendency to ask for other fighters to be on their card. And so I get that part of the negotiation, but <clears throat> once you've agreed to taking the fight and there's really not much else to negotiate. And also if this being the main event, there's already like a cooked in bonus. Normally, if you're the main event, you get another 50 grand, another hundred grand, whatever it is. Um, and is it a pay-per-view? Is it not? Is it a fight night? You know, it base it's all based on that as well. So, that I guess what I was getting at is that if the fight if fight seemed like it was agreed to already, so I don't understand what the, what all the what exactly would they be negotiating is is where it comes down to your contracts. You have let's just say you did a six fight deal. You know what each fight is going to make you. And if you lost off your last fight, it normally doesn't go up the next fight. So you're you're right back where you were anyways at that fight that you lost at. So um, the the show money and the win money is already cooked in. You know, the per diem's already cooked in. The hotel room's already cooked in. If you're a main event, um, you know, they give you an extra hotel room. They give you extra money. They give you an extra corner. They give you extra stuff. You know, they give you an extra flight. They do all these little things that are in there. Now, I know everyone's contract is different, but that's already cooked into your six-fight deal. So, what, or eight-fight or four-fight yeah. or whatever it is you signed. Yeah. Whatever it yeah, is. Yeah, whatever it is you signed. So, I mean, that being said, uh you know, I, I didn't see what everyone got all up in arms about when we were talking about it is that there wasn't <clears throat> there wasn't much else to say when we were you guys don't even know what you're talking about with the, the media and this and that. And I said, it just seemed like there was what do you like? What exactly are you pushing when when you actually know how contracts work and you know that fight? The, and there was a lot of media going, man, they do this shit all the time. It's unprofessional or it's like forcing the fighter into a fight. I, <laughs> I just, what exactly are you arguing about though? Like these guys, the fighters know what they're there to do. They're not going to make any money unless they fight. They know what their contract oh, yeah. is. Hold on. How are you for- forcing a fighter into a fight? How? Yeah, no. no, no. It just comes down to, they feel like if they announce it, I can see it from the other side though too, John. If a, if the promotion, which you're part of the biggest promotion in the world, now you're saying, hey, um, you know, and they go out there and announce it, you feel like you're obligated to now take that fight. Maybe there was things that you wanted to talk about. Maybe you didn't want to fight them wherever the fight's going to be at. Maybe you wanted to fight them at the Apex. Maybe you want to, you know, maybe you want to fight them in in L.A. You know, Why? but some maybe maybe it's in Kentucky, and you're like, you know what? Can we maybe fight? I'll take the next fight. When's the next fight? At? Where's the next fight? Next fight's in Dallas. I'll do that fight. Can we do? Can I, I'll fight him there. You know, nobody wants to fight in Kentucky. Come on, John. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. I was just in Kentucky. Kentucky's a fantastic state. I didn't say it wasn't. <laughs> I didn't say, but no one wants to fight there. <laughs> uh, <sighs> anyways, all right, look, so podcast Dave is in California, doesn't have his screen and everything all set up, so you have to bear with us because I'm going to run us through this fight card that's coming up. This is what, UFC Come Vegas, on. what, 86? 86. Yes. Yep, I feel like we just did 85. It's because we did. <laughs> we did. Uh, all right, but hey, let's go ahead and start with that with that main event, man. You got Joe Pfeiffer versus uh, Jack Hermanson. Good fight, John. Good fight. Strange, strange matchup when you think about it. Why is that? Because Pfeiffer honestly is coming. Uh, look at he's proven himself. Mm-hmm. Came out for the Dana White Contender Series. 
He has shown that, man, he'll fight anyone. He's got big-time power in his hands. Jack Hermanson was a guy who was right there. He was right there. He was right in the middle of the mix of, hey, this guy could get a title shot. This guy's right there and all that stuff. And then kind of just fell off a little bit. But, I mean, who has Pfeiffer fought that you can look at and say has fought the level that Jack Hermanson has? It hasn't happened yet. And he's not in that, you know, that position to say that he's in the top 10 of the, the middleweight division. I just look at it. Jack Hermanson has really fought a who's who in the middleweight division. Sometimes he wins, sometimes he loses, but you know, he's come up with some great submission victories. This is a big fight for Joe Pfeiffer. Huge fight in my opinion. And and not one that I'm saying he can't win. He's got the power to put anybody out. All right, let's take a look at this. I'm going to take a look at this right now. John. Go ahead. Look at take this. a look at that. I no, I agree I agree so with So who is Joe Pfeiffer oh. off of the Dana White mm -hmm. contender series? Yep. He, I'm trying to remember the first fight he had. It was, um, I can't remember. Who was his first fight off the Dana White Contender Series well, let me, in the UFC? Let me look that up, too. Yeah, you're supposed to be looking at this. I don't have ah, John can't do two things at once. I got to do it. <laughs> I'm pulling it up, but between coming off mute and then... Uh, and yeah. then uh, nah, don't it worry was, about it. You know what? I'll even Alan, get it. It was Alan Amidovsky. Okay, so he went. He he fought Amadovsky, who actually was you know had a good record for a while, uh, was known to have good power in his hands, mm -hmm. but kind of really fell off. You know, and had had a long win streak and then loss, 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 one win, loss, 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 really fell off of it and stuff. But so he fights Amadovsky. He's been doing grappling tournaments. I know that, and he's had a couple of them with different people and stuff. But then he he fought Al Hassan. That would that would be the big, you know, fight if you're going to sit there and say who's the guy, you know. And, and Al Hassan is, is a guy that went up from 170 into 185, and he look he's got a great record as far as you know. He's got some big wins, you know, a couple of wins against like uh, Sabah Homasi mm -hmm. and that. But I mean, Jack Hermanson, take a look at who he's fought. You know, if, you, if you're looking at it right now, you got to be looking and saying, in the UFC, he's got to have 10 wins. Okay. Somewhere in that area. 10, 9, 10, 11, somewhere right in there. Who you got, Dave? How many how many fights you have and who, yeah. how many of them are in the top 10, you think? Uh, oh, top 10. So mm -hmm. um, so his last fight was the lead to the loss. Uh, mm -hmm. Beat Chris Curtis. Lost to Sean Strickland. Uh, beat Shabazian, Shabazian. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, beat Shabazian, but beat Kelvin Gastelum. I know that. Yeah, beat Gastelum. Right. Uh, beat uh, Ronaldo Souza. Yeah, uh, Ronaldo Souza. Yeah, was, uh, yeah. Jacques, Jacques, yeah. Jacques, uh, yeah. Beat yeah, Jacques David Ray. Branch, who was in the <clears> top. <throat> uh, Twenty nine team is probably in the top top fifteen at that point. Uh, beat Jeremy Sharp. Um, okay. But, Talis but he's fought. Probably not. Know, let's be honest. He's fought Marvin Vittori, mm -hmm. right? Now I know well, he lost. I think he lost a decision in that decision. one because that was a, it was a good fight back and forth. He's mostly stand up with it. He lost to uh, Sean Strickland. Split. Okay. What's that? Split decision. Split decision against. Okay. I know he's got a win over Chris Curtis. He's fought some tough yeah. competition. Mm -hmm. Kelvin Gastelum, Sean Strickland. I mean, look look at these guys. You know, that's so good. Like Edmund Shabazian. Edmund was you know. They were bringing him up big time and probably put him a little bit ahead of where he should have been, you know. And so maybe you know that's when you look and you go, well, you should have won that. But you know, overall, he's been up against good, talented guys, and he's in a position right now. Pfeiffer, if he beats Pfeiffer, what does it do for him? But if Pfeiffer beats him, it's definitely going to push Pfeiffer up. Yeah, but John, he's he's all he's been doing lately is falling backwards. So they yeah. got to get him back yeah. on track. Last get him, get him some of those little bit of hype around Pfeiffer right now. Like, let's go ahead and talk. But his last loss is against Delizia, I believe. No, I get it. Right? I understand that. And so in, in, in fighting a guy that just had the main event, mm -hmm. it's not like they're putting him against chumps. No, I know. I mean, but you look at, I guess, look, if I'm invested in fight, you know, as well as I know, fighters that come off the ultimate fighter and fighters that come off the Dana White contender series, they're going to get a little bit more love than the fighters that are coming up through the organization. 
those fighters that come up through the organization are going to have to work their ass off to get, you know, they're sure. going to have six, seven fights, wins in a row, and two or three of them better be impressive. You better have finishes. Yeah. And um, and I've had this conversation with Joe Silva back in the day when he brought me on. I was supposed to fight Matt Serra, got hurt. I was supposed to fight Jao Perini, got hurt. I was supposed to fight these guys, but then when I got, then when I finally got the fight against Strebent, <clears throat> he called me up. He's like, look, you owe me a damn favor for this fight. It's like they needed to see impressive performances, and that's kind of where you're at. Like you, you need to go out there and finish him. Is kind of what Joe told me. If you don't get this finished, it's gonna be a problem. Like we've been waiting on you for this long, and this is the deal. So fighters that come up through the organization, they 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 kind of like will point them in the right direction, but they're not having guys that come off the date or they the guys they're not treating them the same as the guys that are coming off Ultimate Fighter and Dana White contender series. But you have to admit that right now, as you're looking at this. They're using Hermanson because Pfeiffer's coming mm -hmm. off of what a seven, seven fight win streak. Mm -hmm. Is that what he's on? I'm, I can't look at it. So if if Pfeiffer's got, coming off a, a six or a seven fight win streak, something it's in there. Five. Okay. Five. They lost to Dustin Stoltz was in between there somewhere. Oh, okay. And five six phase ago. Mm -hmm. But he's on a good win streak. So are they using, in your opinion, are they putting Hermanson in a position? Based upon a guy that's got a pretty good name, a guy that's fought good competition, we're just trying to build Joe Pfeiffer. Uh, I, absolutely, okay. absolutely. I mean, John, he went from being ranked, I think, what number five or number four, somewhere in there, and then now he's ranked number ten. He's on the decline in, in the eyes of the UFC. He's on the decline. I don't. How old is uh, Hermanson? He's not that old. Hermanson is thirty-five. Yeah. Coming on thirty six. How old is Pfeiffer? He's getting up into that twenty eight. Oh, Pfeiffer's younger. Pfeiffer is twenty seven. <laughs> there you go. Like <laughs> there you go. That, that's right. your answer right there. I mean, look, yeah. there's no doubt what the U the UFC has a it, most promotions, not just the UFC, but the UFC has guidelines of what they try to do. When you hit that 35, 36 year old mark, we're looking to make you the benchmark for somebody else. We're trying. Yeah. We're trying to make you the gatekeeper. We're trying to, to use your name, to, yes, to, to build up, up our younger career. talent, and that's how this that's, that's how this whole thing works. Uh, hey guys, interesting point on that. What Josh, you saying that right now is that, uh, Dustin did an interview today, Dustin Parry, and he was talking about about the uh, the Saint Denis fight, and he's like, yeah, you know, like I'm 35 now, like I'm kind of that guy the UFC, like you know, I know my place in the sport, kind of mm -hmm. like um, I got to I got to test myself, yes, but like I like I respect the sport and that like you know I got to mm -hmm. test myself against these younger guys. Um, and so I thought, you know, you said you just literally repeated what he said. Yeah. I mean, look, it's not just that, but we just had Gilbert Burns on. He went through the same, he's going through the same thing right now. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Gilbert True. is somebody who is, you know, he's getting up in age. I think he's 37 or 38. And the bottom line is, is they're looking to try to build somebody else on him. That's where we're at. And so, Boy. and, and that's, they're going to be, that's good. They're trying to make them younger every chance they get. That's what they're trying to do. Yes. And so if, if I can have a, a 20, a 24, 20, if they can get another John Jones, like obviously oh, in hopes of that level, but I'm saying that if they get someone who's that young that can become champion, they're going to do whatever they could. They tried doing it with Pettis. That's sure. what, I mean, that's a big reason I feel like that they, they had him pull out of the fight with me. It was like, he was 26 at the time. He had a great story, you know, um, you know, with, with you know just the success he had in terms of with his you know uh his father and everything like that it was a story that they could build on uh put him on the wheaties box everything was there for him and so uh, they knew what they were doing trying to use a young talent to try to catapult him into uh stardom right off the bat and yeah. i think with five for the relationships dana's attached to him somehow some way not just because he's dana white contender series but i know that dana did him some favors he lent him some money yeah he did you know and <clears throat> And uh, but he, all he's but, done is come out on. and train. That was a good thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So, um, look, I, I look, I think they're looking at Hermanson like he's number 10. He's very beatable right now. He's on the decline a little bit. Uh, what are, who are we going to see? Be. Can he handle Pfeiffer's power? Powers, fi uh, power, uh, powers, Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer's power. Uh, you know, he's got big power. He's good takedown defense, heavy hips, strong as fucking, as uh, strong as an ox. So we're going to see. We're going to see what happens in this fight. But I'm looking. I'm kind of, I got to be honest. Last week's card, I looked at it. I was like, 
I, I don't want to be a negative Nancy because Dave's always yelling at you and I about God, stop being so fucking negative. Yeah, the card sucks. We yeah. So we try to be a little bit more positive when we look at a card and go, eh. but this card though, it actually has some pretty damn good fights that I'm pretty pumped for. So, I mean, th- this card is, I mean, I'm a big Andre Feely fan, but I'm also a huge Dan Ige fan. So that's yep. another fight that's, that we're going to talk that's, about. That's the co-main. That's right? the co-main right here. So, so yeah. Dan Ige versus uh touchy Feely. What you got? Ooh, Man, I, I love this fight. Cause I, you just watch Andre Feely in his last fight. Dan Ige, watch him in his last fight. You know, Ige is that guy that you know he's going to go out there and he's just going to be a dog. He's going to be in the middle of your grill. He's going to be trying to land big shots. He's good on the ground. You know, Andre Feely, I think Andre's faster than him. He's got more range than him. He will have problem with the pressure that Dan brings because Dan will try to walk through what you throw. He'll eat your shots to try to deliver his own. Mm -hmm. On the ground, I think Dan has a little bit of an advantage. I think it's going to be difficult for him to get Andre to the ground. Uh, But they match up very well. You know, it's a matter of who's on in this fight. I I always look at it and say, when Andre Feely is on, he's hard to beat. Dan Ige is a much more, uh, I want to say, he's always basically the same. He's always coming out. He puts on a good performance. He 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 presses people. He lands big shots. He doesn't have big drops in his performances. And so he's the guy, if you're going to look at and say, who are you going to look at and say is the guy for, you know, the length of his career has had a more steady, you know, fight to fight impact i'm gonna say that it's ige you know but feely can have that performance and he has had him you know the last one he had was beautiful you know and he could definitely pull off a a surprise win here because i think it would be a surprise if he beat ige but it's not that much when you look at it how talented andre feely is yeah Feely's found his way i think he is matured as a fighter matured probably as a, a person as well he i think is a little bit more focused on what the goal is. And the goal is to try to, to win fights and make as much money as you can. It's sad that it Ooh. took him this long to, to get to get that way because he had so much talent, some just natural talent and ability. And that's the problem sometimes with young fighters because they think it's going to be around forever. And then next thing you know, they're slowing down. They're like, okay, I'm ready to train hard. Nope, it's gone. The moment's passed. The moment's passed. Uh, but he's still fast as hell, and Dan Ige is very hittable. Uh, where I think this fight is gonna is gonna take a turn is that Dan's pressure is gonna make him fight an uncomfortable fight. Dan's gonna keep keep right inside his grill, He'll stay in his grill, stay fight him in a phone booth, and he's gonna make it a dirty, grimy fight. And now Feely can fight a dirty, grimy fight, but as he does that, he will slow down. Whereas Dan won't. Dan will get grimy in that clinch. He will get the takedowns. He'll threaten the takedowns. Dan's got good top pressure. He's got heavy hips. Once he gets to the top position, doesn't have great wrestling. But his wrestling is good enough, I think, to get Feely to the ground. He's just got to get in and close that distance uh, to get to the body lock or get in on the on the pressing him to the fence to get in on the takedown. If he can do something along those lines, if he can engage to the point where it puts Feely's back foot on that fence, he'll have a better chance. If he stands in the center of that cage, I think that he could end up being no, some big a, shots and the power that Feely has good. in those hands, man, and they're fast. That's a bad place. Yep. For Danny Gate to be against Feely. If he's in the center of the cage and he's not being able to press Feely backwards, Feely, he's got range, he's got speed. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's a tough and one. And he knows how to use it. That's the other thing. It's not that yeah. he's not that he is someone that just has his range and just has, you know, the speed. No, he knows how to use it. He sets up yeah. his combinations well. He's got something, he's got power in his hands. So, it, it definitely, Dan's, and Dan's hittable. That's the other thing that makes this fight interesting. That's what makes Dan so fun to watch is that he is hittable. They're like, damn, it's yeah, so easy. Well, it can touch you and touch you. But then as you start to get tired from punching yourself out on his face, he starts pressing you to the fence and grinding on you and elbowing you in the face and making it dirty. And the next you know, you're fucking tails between your legs and you're you're rolling over <laughs> and getting out of there. So True. he's a beast, man. Dan Ige right. is a beast. But th- that to me is going to be a fun fight. So when I look at like, when I was looking at the car, John, I was like, man, I go, Dan Ige and Philly fantastic fight do we see the star do we see a rising star in, in pfeiffer versus uh hermanson does he does he beat the old grizzle veteran someone who's been in there with everyone there's a storyline yep. behind this card 
You know, the yeah. last card, I didn't really see it a whole lot. I just saw like they put together fights that seemed like they were good. There was not much of a storyline. This card has some good fights, and some good storylines. But I mean, look at you got Brad Tavares versus uh, Gregory Rodriguez, Robocop. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry, but I can't imagine of a, a knockdown drag out fight more than I'd like to see this one. This one's going to be a good fight. These two are going to stand fight. in the middle and can trade. That's what they're going to do. Brad Tavares has learned how to be a very competent and good fighter that gives everyone problems. He's got good speed. He's got good power. He can grapple when you, know, you try to take him down. He's got good takedown defense. When he wants to try to take you down, he turns the corner and he does he does everything well. You know, when he started off, you know, he was on the ultimate fighter. He had a lot of holes in his games. He's he's filled a lot of those holes up. And he's the real deal. But you look at, you know, Rodriguez in the fact Robocop is he'll stand and bang with you, but his jujitsu is phenomenal if it goes to the ground. And you and you wanna look at someone like that and say, you need to take it to the ground more, but that's not easy to do against someone like a Brad Tavares, who again, now his, you know, wrestling defense is outstanding. So it's a great matchup. When guys spend, they're going to bang. When guys have power like Tavares does, they've got the speed, and their whole career people have tried to take him down. <coughs> a lot of what they do at the gym is just take down defense. They do a lot of wall yeah. drill. They do a lot of sprawling out in the open mat. Can't blame them. They can't. And so. Rodriguez is going to have a hard time, I think, getting him down. If he's able to get a takedown early in the fight, if, say the first two minutes, I think it'll start to snowball a little bit and start slowing Tavares down. But I think yeah. it's going to be a lot harder than you think. I think Tavares is still really explosive, not just with the hands, but his kicks, all those things. And that lead he's leg. He's as good as he's ever been. Yeah. That lead leg calf kick, yeah. that lead leg leg kick, he's got some power in those kicks and he sets it up really well behind his hands. And he also sets up his uh, hands behind his kicks very well. He's a very well-rounded fighter, and he's just fun to watch, man. I enjoy every time he steps in there. He's someone that, like I said, you turn the channel, like, like you're not turning it. If I catch him in the middle of a of a bout as I'm flipping through channels, I'm not turning the channel. I'm thinking, no, nope, <laughs> this is too good. I got Brad Tavares fight. I'm going to watch the rest of the fight. So yep. good fight for him, I think. I think it's going to be a fun fight as well. Uh, okay. Then the next fight for me, this is going to be a great fight oh. as well. So you got Darius Flowers versus Michael Johnson. Another good fight. It is another good fight, but when you're taking a look and you know, you're really saying, okay, there comes that point, age. When Darius Flowers is like 28, 29 years of age. Michael Johnson's been there a long time now, man. A long time. And he's getting up in age, but he's still fast. And he still moves good. And he's got, you know, he's got great stand up. He's got good wrestling. The wrestling is kind of like, you know, gone to the wayside with him. He just wants to be in there and throw his hands and tell you what he can throw hands with anyone he is fun to watch you know you're in for a fight it's a darius flowers got good power so i think they they're gonna sit there and they're, they're gonna wing shots at each other but you could never you can never say that michael johnson is out of any fight you can't because he's got the speed you know i mean he doesn't have the one crunch knockout power even though he has been able to knock somebody out but it's like you get into the the fight uh with flowers flowers he's got crunch power but he's a lot yep, slower yeah. than Michael Johnson. The thing that I kind of uh, Michael Johnson's last fight though, coming off of a nasty knockout. Yeah. So where is he That's at? What I'm where is he at mentally? Where is he? You know, there, there's a lot to be said about coming off of a loss like that. I just think I also think look, just the speed. He's been there before though too, so mentally he knows how to deal sure with is. it. Um, but he is what 37 years of age I now. Think so yeah, still fast yeah, as fuck though. <laughs> yeah, he is, but it's it's you know, it's uh, the things that have, have you know been happening recently in his fights. You know, these are the things. You know, he's got. I know he had the win against uh, 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 Mark. Uh, what was it? Uh, Mark Gagne. Yeah, Kessie. Yeah, oh, Kessie. Yeah. He had a he had a nice win. It was a uh, unanimous decision. And it was funny because Diakese was trying to wrestle with him at times mm -hmm. and stuff when you thought it was just going to be a stand up war. But he did knock uh, out Alan Patrick uh, two years ago as well. Yeah, but he also lost to uh, Jamie Malarkey. Right? Yeah, Malarkey. Yeah. Yeah. Split. Yeah, and so you look and you go, you know, it's you know, win, loss, win, loss. Mm -hmm. But the the knockout, you know, by Diego, that's that that's the ones that you now look at and go, is that the one that's going to make it to where all of a sudden he's not the same fighter? He's yeah. not able to 
take the same shots. Now he's he he's just waiting instead of throwing his hands because he's unsure and he's feeling like he's getting stung by these. So it's going to be a so he's got to stay out of the power of Darius Flowers. It's going to be harder yeah. for Flowers. He's shorter as far as reach and everything to touch him. But if he gets inside, he could do damage. Yeah, I think the speed's going to be too much. And I, to go back on what oh, yeah, you just said, be. what you just said was, is he going to be in there? Because like as I got older and other fighters, I see it. They they throw and they kind of wait in there because they're afraid of getting mm-hmm. hit. They kind of cover up and they freeze for a second. They wait to get hit. Wait, yeah, they wait to get hit to, to make sure they can hunker down and take the shot. The yeah. thing is, though, is that, John, the reason why they do that is because I was one of them is that because you're we know we're slowing down and we're getting hit a lot more often. This motherfucker's so fast. I don't think he even worries about it. Like he's so fast, John. He's still fast he at however old he I, is. Yeah. You know, you know, I know he got caught his last fight. I know he got caught by Josh Emmett, but man, let's not forget. He is putting some work. He was putting the biscuits on Josh Emmett until Josh Emmett caught him. He was he was touching him. Stuff, he was man. touching him, man. Look, but well, and you, he, the thing about Michael Johnson, when you take a look at the people this guy has oh, yeah. stepped into the cage with, yeah, I mean, it's remarkable when you really go back. I I, I can think of you know I wasn't a very good l- uh, luck referee for him because he didn't seem to win with my dumb. Fuck, ass that's two of us. No, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, you actually won a lot. I did, you know, I did. Was, but I mean. The two that I come off the top of my head, Justin Gaethje and Habib Nurmagomedov. Mm. It's like, well, Jesus Christ, man! You know that's, you know, he and, and that Justin Gaethje fight he had. Oh, holy shit. Fuck. one of the greatest fights holy I've ever shit. seen in my life. What a fight, man! Unbelievable. Yeah, one of the greatest fights I've ever seen in my life. I mean, yeah. that was impressive. And then super, yeah. But then when I watched him fight Habib, I was like, damn, bro, that's I've been there, dude. He hurt Habib. He did. The start of that fight, he hurt him. He 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 stung him. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> nope. Because even, dude, even me, I was like, oh, he's hurt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe. Yeah. No, he was hurt. I'll never tell. <laughs> I'll never tell. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. But that's a great fight, man. And I think Darius Flowers, the speed's gonna be a problem. <laughs> but if he is yeah. able to to get the timing down and something, or maybe make him miss, make him pay, there's a good chance he can get him out of there. Where I feel that Michael Jansen has a good advantage as well, which we won't see, is in the wrestling and the top position. Darius Flowers is not good on the ground. He's decent, but he's not. I think Michael Johnson is the bat, better especially. wrestler, the better better grappler. I think he's better all the way around on the ground if this fight does hit the ground. I don't see it going there, but I do I do think nope. that that uh, Michael Johnson is the better wrestler and grappler. Okay. Uh, next fight, you got Hadolfo Vieira versus uh, oh. Petrosian. Armand yeah, you talk about Armand a stylistic... Uh... Yeah. Stylistic matchup of the differences. Obviously, Adolfo Vieira, phenomenal jujitsu, incredible. Does not have the greatest gas tank in the world. Has uh, lost <laughs> his fights off of, you know what, getting tired. But uh, Petrosian, we know, is very good in the stand-up. He's got, he's got very good fast hands, good kicks. Not going to be that great off of the ground. No matter what they say, his groundwork is just not that good. So he has to keep this fight on his on you know, the feet to be successful. If he allows, and it really comes down to Vieira, if he takes the fight to the ground, which he absolutely can, he just needs to take his time. You're in control. You're the, you're the guy with all the skill set there. Take your time, you know. Do some damage while you're down there, and work to the point where he's giving up the submission to you. You're not having to fight for it, John. It's the fear. Of that fighter getting up that makes them yeah. tense. It's the fear yeah. of I have to close the distance again and I'm gonna I, I could potentially right now. Yeah. It's the potential yeah. of I may get knocked out if I have to stand back up or he gets up and I gotta get this takedown again. And every time that fighter gets up, it just like the video game, it just depletes your energy of just exhaustion and and doubt it just causes all these things that just you're not ready to deal with inside the cage. It's a stress. Stress does it to you know, stress kills you. you no know? matter what it's about. I mean, I gotta be honest, there should be a little less stress with the with the smaller crowd in there because even though you know thousands, you know, of people, hundreds of thousands of people are watching, you maybe lose at home, but you don't see them. But only like 50 people inside the apex are watching you get, you know, right. get tired. So there's less stress when it's it's worse when 
And it's there's twenty thousand. The cage people. is better for him. What's that? The cage, the cage in the apex yeah. is better for him. It's smaller. That's true. And less less room for a guy like Petrosian who's got, you know, really good stand up to move. That is something I completely I keep forgetting and I keep overlooking is that the cage in the apex is smaller. The cage in the apex. Remember the old WEC? Oh yeah. The cage that they had uh-huh. the WEC was a 25 foot cage. The UFC's cage is a 30 foot, meaning from, you know, the inside of the pole, you know, the the fence to fence is 30 feet. Not 32? No. 30. I thought, Everyone thinks I thought it's 32. it was 32. No, no, it's 30 feet across. But the, the WECs is 25. But when you take 25 and you're taking those panels and you're oh, taking five feet, it makes that cage much smaller. Much smaller. And so that's what the UFC has always used in their smaller shows and now with the Apex because it fits in the, the room better. You know, allows them to put more seats if they want. So favors a wrestler and a grappler every time. Oh, it can. But man, nothing ever was fucking more exciting than the fucking king of the cage, fourteen feet across. <laughs> Dude, that thing was horrible, man. I could almost put my hands to both sides <laughs> out and touch that fucking it was like, cage. Jesus Christ, look at that thing. When you had two horrible. heavyweights or two fucking light heavyweights oh, in there, man. it was like all they did just half a step forward and they were fighting. Yeah. They're, there was nowhere were, for them to go. Grappling. No, they could they, they both take a step forward and they were they were touching each other. <laughs> it was fucking great, man. <laughs> it was so great. We, we would go. I remember, God, who do I see in there? I remember seeing Quentin Jackson fighting the King of the Cage. I remember seeing. Oh uh, my God. Yeah. yeah, I remember Bobby Southward being there. I'm thinking, man, you two guys are huge. They didn't fight each other. They were supposed to fight each other. The fight fell through, yeah. but they didn't fight each other. But still, when I saw the two of them in there both times, I was like, man. Half a step out, and you guys are fighting. There's nowhere for you guys to go. Oh, it was. It was they had some of the best <laughs> fights, though, John. I was I was introduced to to Quentin uh, Rampage Jackson on the on the night that he was going to fight Marvin Eastman mm. in King of the Cage, and I was told, "Hey, man, you got to watch my guy. My guy, man, he you know, he's tough. You know, and you know he just slams people and stuff." And it's like, all right, right. And Quentin goes out there. I've never he had he, you know the remember the old white athletic socks that would go up to your knees. Oh yeah, right. He had those all the way up to his <laughs> knees. Wrestling shoes on, black shorts. Oh. He got head kicked three times in that fight. I mean, solid. No, you know, no block. <laughs> and he just went uh, and walked forward. And I went, who the uh, fuck is, is that guy? guy? <laughs> By Marvin Eastman, he got kicked in the head. By Marvin Eastman, Jesus. yeah. Marvin Eastman looked like a truck, man. You know, it was like built like a brick shit house, man. He was just put together, and it was like, wow. But uh, he didn't. Uh, Quentin didn't win that fight that night. But you looked, and you out of the two, you looked, and you said, man, they're both good. Yep. But that dude's gonna be somebody because man, he can Insane. just walk through anything. Insane. He was awesome. Uh, all right, so John, I'm gonna read through a couple of the fights on the prelims here. Uh, you got Trevin Giles versus Carlos uh, <clears throat> Pratt's. And you've got Demir, I can't even say his last name, Hadzovic versus Bellagio <laughs> Oki. And then you've got Luma, Luke Boon. Oh, Bume Luma. Versus Bruno yeah, Brazil. Luke and Bume. Versus Bruno Brazil. Oh, that's a good fight. <laughs> I enjoy watching Luma I fight do. because she, man, she just brings it. She throws big time, hard elbows. She's she's getting better and better on the ground, too. I, I, I've enjoyed watching her and i enjoy watching her progress and i want to see where she can get because that that young lady brings it yep. and then she's just enjoyable to watch so what i also like too is that she's getting a lot better or not getting she's understanding when to utilize her foot sweeps and her throws and all that because muay thai has a ton of those yeah from muay thai yeah. from muay thai she utilizes them now and a lot of people every time they get close to her just think they're going to take her down no 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 she utilizes as you get close and you clinch her to try to take her down. She foot sweeps you. She hip tosses you. She throws you. She does all of these things to end up in the top yep. position. Sadly, she sucks at jiu-jitsu. And so she ends up being... <laughs> it's getting better. It is. Her defense getting is getting better. better. Yes. Yeah. But uh, but in the clinch and the elbows and her kicks, all those things, she throws with bad intentions. I love it. I love watching her fight. She yeah. is fun to watch fight. Um, Outside of that, you got Max Griffin and Jeremiah Wells. That should be a good fight. That's a good fight. I believe that's going to be a good I, fight. I, I love watching Max Griffin fight because he comes just to fight. So. Yep. 
Um, but mm-hmm. I think that's going to pretty much wrap up our talk. I mean, I like the Trevin Giles uh, fight versus Carlo uh, Carlos uh, Preitz. I, but uh, mm-hmm. Trevin Giles is always fun to watch. I enjoy watching him fight. Uh, I don't recall, just to be honest, John, I don't recall seeing Carlos fight. So I'm not going to say too much. <laughs> but, <laughs> Uh, uh, outside of that, though, yeah, the Luma fight, Devin Clark, and uh, I, th- I think Carlos Prater just came off of a win with the Dana White series. Carlos Prates, and, is uh, it Pr- it's Prats, yeah. Prates, 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 and then. Th- but I'm looking forward to the Jeremiah Wells and Max Griffin fight. That should be a good fight. Very good fight. All right, guys. Hey, that's gonna wrap up our UFC 86, our Vegas 86. Uh, before we move on, though, go to OnlyFans.com slash Wayne in. OnlyFans.com slash Wayne in. Subscribe to us over there. Thank you guys so much. And, um, yeah, let's go ahead and move on. Dave, what else you got for us, buddy? There's a boxing fight. I'll let you guys pronounce <laughs> the names because I'm not familiar with them, and I will mess it up. Oh, if you're going to say – go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I started to take your – No, no, go ahead, John. Go ahead. Is it the Bivol Yeah, fight? the Bivol fight. Oh. You talk about possibly the best fight that you could put together. I know they're trying to put together Canelo and Crawford, mm-hmm. which it's just the size is going to be difficult to do as far as the way that mm-hmm. is. Uh, but uh, I hate to say I don't, I'm going to screw up his last name as far as a uh, beat bitter it's Bet- bitter beef bitter beef bitter, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Beater Beef. Beater Beef. Beater Beef. But he's, dude, you talk about a guy that he's good. Yeah. He is fun to watch. He throws hard shots. He's got actually good footwork, good movement. Bivol, we all know how good he is. That's the best fight in the light heavyweight division you could put together. I'm looking forward to seeing it. I'm not going to reserve my thoughts on it until I do a little bit more research on bitter beef or whatever. Bitter beef. Yeah. I do know though that I just watched him fight like, but only like probably like two or three rounds of it and, to see my and he was dominating the fight. So I'm going to go back and watch that fight again. Um, <clears throat> I do remember him dominating the fight and I think he ended up walking away with it pretty handily. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to go ahead and give more reserve on that. Uh, but John, there's something else we have to chat about real quick before we, uh, before we go is, is a lot of the speculation on the 165, 175, you know, getting rid of the 175, 70 pound weight class. <clears throat> and we've had this conversation for, for years now, you and I, and I know a lot of promotions and a lot of fighters have all, have all been pitching for it, especially when Habib was in the, was in the UFC. There was a lot of talk about it because Habib always struggling to make weight, being one of them, being the most dominant fighter, especially in the lightweight division, but probably in the sport over a lifetime in term <clears throat> in our lifetime. Anyways, he has been the most dominant fighter inside the cage. The, the 165 pound weight class would have been very beneficial to him. 155 he could make 165 is probably right where he would have loved to have been. But that doesn't mean you get rid of 55. You go 55, 65, 75, and pushing Leon up to, I think, 75. I, I don't know. Maybe Leon could make 65. I don't know. But I mean, we're, it, it really does. And you've said this for the longest time. All The 65-pound the weight class has been there. It's always been there. Promotions just choose not to use it. It's been there since 2017. And the 75-pound weight class, is that there also? Yeah. Okay. 75 and 65, both there. Okay. So those weight classes are there. If you add those two weight classes, I kind of feel like there's going to be the reason why I think this may potentially happen is there's going to come a time when the UFC may decide that we are a very big promotion and we are now joined with the WWE and that we feel like we could probably host and carry our own network or at least have content that fills that. And you can kind of see that they're laying the groundwork with that, with the UFC fight pass. They're letting guys like George Masvidal go ahead and go out. He's still under contract. Go ahead and go out, have fights outside of the UFC. But those fights have to be displayed on the UFC fight pass. Certain fighters, Nate Diaz went out, you know, and look, he's gone. But I'm saying like they try to get his fights on the UFC fight pass. There's certain fighters they're going to allow to go ahead and fight outside when they've realized, but they, hey, we still have one or fight, two fights left with you. Go out there and do whatever it is you want to do, but we want you to host to whatever fight you're going to be involved in on UFC Fight Pass. They're building their library. They're doing a great job of it. 
everyone, a lot of people have UFC Fight Pass. And eventually, I think what you're going to see is, hey, ESPN is the place you go for sports. No one's going to deny that. But I think what you're talking about, what I'm talking about is they're eventually going to go, look, why we want to keep giving them this amount of money when we can make all the money ourselves. That's what most top level business people do. And I think with the UFC and the WWE having the type of following that they have, and they decide to push everything over to the UFC Fight Pass and use their app to do that, I think eventually that you're going to see them potentially go there, especially as the streaming services start to go out and they get, and they develop a little bit more uh, more efficiently and better. Um, I think that's that's, a, that's the whole key. Yeah. You, you got to have you can you can look at several different uh, apps. Yeah, you do have the UFC Fight Pass, but you have Fight TV, you have Triller, mm-hmm. you have DAZN, you have these. These are the ones that are putting basically fights, be it boxing or mm-hmm. MMA or bare knuckle boxing, putting them on a streaming service. So you know you're right. Right. The, you have read it. I mean, I'm sure you've heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> any 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 time you have, you know, the ability to make more money, they're going to look at you know doing that. Mm-hmm. The UFC's got a great deal. They do with ESPN, a great deal. So I, I'm not saying that they wouldn't eventually say, "Okay, it's time for us to part ways." But right now, I think they're happy with what they have. Yeah. But you're you're right; they are probably moving. The real question with the weight classes has been promoters not so much caring, you know, about it. I think it. I think Dana would like to have the extra weight class because it only helps them in putting championship fights on his pay-per-view cards it's always the matchmakers yep the matchmakers are the ones that go oh no 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 don't screw up my weight classes because you know you're gonna water them down that's a lie i can see someone saying that if it was right now bellator pfl you know any of those the ufc's got way too many fighters they they could absolutely Take some from the 170 and put them to the 165. Some of those can go to the 175. You could get some from the 155 going to the 165 and some from 185 going to 175. It would match up well. Right now you've got like uh, Kelvin Gaslam has dropped to 170. He lost his first fight there at 170 against Sean Brady. But you, you could put him where he would be really comfortable at 175 that's a great weight class for them. And so everyone's got their place to, to fit in. And if there was any promotion that had the, the roster to make those two weight classes work and work right now, it's the UFC yeah. by far. So they could do it. It's just a matter of when they want to. Well, I've had this discussion with Rich Chow when he was the matchmaker with Bellator. I've had it with Mike Kogan. I've had it with Scott Coker. I've had it with you know, other matchmakers in some of the other organizations. Sure. The thing and what is, was it? a lot of it was, well, for some of them, it was like, it's not going to make that big of a difference in terms of what we are trying to do here. And I was like, okay, if that's, a, if that's your approach, I understand. Like, let's focus on the fighters we do have. Well, and I mean, you can sit there and say, that's fine. I'm not saying they're wrong, but mm-hmm. the whole time, basically that, you know, you were at Bellator and I was at Bellator. <laughs> They never had a 125-pound weight class. Yeah. Did they? Nope. Okay. Eventually, they started to put it in there. Why? Well, because you had Horiguchi, who's a stud. Okay. Okay. (laughs) So you find that fighter that you go, oh, I can put marketing behind this guy. This is a guy that's exciting to watch. This is a guy that's good. That's the whole thing. But right now, everyone forms into that, okay, we're going to go 155 or we're going to go 170. The best part about the taking away the 170 and putting in the 65 and 75 is you just, it's just that 10 pound difference on each one 45 to 55, 65 to 75, 75 to 85. It makes sense. No, it does make sense. I think what I'm going to play like a little conspiracy theorist here in that I think that the UFC, if they were to do this and announce this, it's perfectly timed is that what happens is you have a moment right now where Bellator and PFL are merging. There's a lot of fighters that were released and there's a lot of fighters that they don't like change. And so if something happens, 
the UFC is bringing these weight classes in at a moment, an opportunity to add more talent. If you have more weight classes, I can absorb more talent. I can use that. I don't know what, how much profit did they make last year? 785, 700, 800 million. More, more, more than you and I did. Okay. So let's just say they made, let's just say they made $650 million last year. Okay. Even if it was 300 million, whatever they made a, a, a pretty damn, they can take some of that profit now and add those two, add those weight classes. You add one more weight class in there and you just change 170 to 75. And now you can help absorb a lot more fighters in there to take, to take more talent away from your, your rivals, your rivals. It's very well played, very well timed. Um, you know, and, and that's, I think that's what makes them so, uh, so dominant, so special right now is that they have the ability to do that because they are so profitable. <clears throat> it's just something to take a look at. When you look at that, it makes sense, right? Like this is a time for us to get the overflow, you know, and um, it's a, it's a, an opportunity that Dana doesn't seem like he lets things go to waste in these type of situations. Well, so. you take a look, you know, being profitable gives you a lot of uh, options. Yep. But the other you know, thing, it's not any, it's not an easy thing to do in today's uh, landscape. So, but if you if you're ESPN, you're probably pushing more for this too, so you don't end up with interim title fights. You don't yeah. end up, you know, I don't need to That's, end up with a with an, a, a UFC eighty six Vegas card without a title shot. I can have a title shot pretty much on every card, or I can try to have a title shot pretty much on every card. Um, you know, and then you have these opportunities now. You, adding one more weight yeah. class is a big deal. You know, you add more hype around them, you sign more talent, you get more people to, that are involved. All those fighters now have followings and they develop followings. I mean, Islam could be a, a two division champ because of 155, 165. You have your top level guys. Izzy, you know, Izzy always wanted to go up, but I mean, he'd have to stay kind of, I don't think they're going to add another one, but I'm saying like in that mix of fighters that were there, who could come down from 70 to fight for the 65 pound title and who could eventually go up? You know, to the seventy-five pound, like you Colby said, Colby Covington could go down, could go down. <clears throat> and you know, I'm I'm being serious when I say that. I think that would be, he's not that big of a guy, mm -hmm. as far as you know, he could actually, I think, make that one sixty-five. You know, and then you, like guys like uh, guys like uh, Sean O'Malley. I know he's tall, long, and lanky, all those things. You know, but he would he would probably like to go up to forty-five. And Taporia has talked about going up to fifty-five. Taporia has. You know, so there's there's a lot of little action. There's some action up in there that could happen. And then if you go to 65, let me take a look at the the 55 pound rankings. You got Justin Gaethje. Well, you got yeah. Dustin. Go ahead. Okay. Hey, I just had a question. I was going to throw in there while you were doing that, but just I'll let you finish this. Part. Go ahead. What's your question, buddy? Well, my question is: is um, uh, do you retire the name welterweight for 170 and have a new name for 175? Or um, or do you move that name over to 175 so you keep the lineage of the championship history? Or do you just keep 170 in there? Because I think Josh was talking about them capitalizing mm -hmm. um, on opportunities. Is it an opportunity to like have those three so close together where now you can crown the first three weight, the first three division champion? Now you're making the history in this time where you're trying to just you're trying to add value to the sport because you've you've done the deal with TKO and you're you know you're trying to bring more eyeballs and get this first time three division right. Um, do you keep it? Do you do you keep one seventy there, or do you just rename it? Or sorry, no, do you, no, you don't keep you seventy there. It goes to seventy five. You and you're saying you can't, Dave? Dave well, no. What what I'm saying is, first off, the other divisions already have names, and, and so if you got rid of the one seventy, you are getting rid of the welterweight division. That was one of the the things that a lot of people talked about. They said, you know, what about the history of that division? And it is something you could look at and say, okay. You know, it's something to think about because you've had some great fighters. You know, George St. Pierre, one of the greatest, you know, mixed martial artists there's been. That was his weight class. You know, Matt Hughes, that was his weight class. You can take and say, you know, Tyrone Woodley or now Leon or Kamaro Usman. You know, there's been great fighters in that weight class. And so I don't think you truly lose it. I think it you just it moves with one way or the other. And I think it moves to the 175 pound because right I think they, they named uh, 165 as super lightweight. That's what I was going to say. I was about to say, I was like, what? So you should call it super lightweight yeah. or you would call so, it light welterweight. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, so it's, I think it's super lightweight. And God. then the, the 175, I think they said was super welterweight. Interesting. Super welter. 
Nice. Look, but they could always change the name of it back to just Welter. Yeah. If they got rid of the 170. Just call it Welter weight. Yeah. 175. Yep. And so then why wouldn't you keep uh 70 and 75 just a for the because you have a lineage but then b so you have that that 75 the, to fill the there gap you have now you're having a, now you're going to have that problem with too many fighters wanting to jump one direction or another yeah it's going to have too much crossover they're too close with the five pound yeah. now you're getting into boxing and this is where boxing lost a lot of its you know the, the true impact of the eight champions that they had at one time you know, and then all of a sudden it was, you know, oh, you had lightweight, you had super lightweight, you had junior lightweight. You, and you have, they went into 17, you know, some have up to 21, you know, weight classes, you know, throughout their organizations, you know, lightest to heaviest. And you just look and you go, it's too many. You water it down. Yeah. It, like once you start talking about boxing weight classes, I'm like, okay, what the fuck does he fight in? What weight is he? I don't yeah. even care. Just tell me the just tell me the weight. Don't even tell me what the name of it is. Oh, he's fighting at 168. Okay, cool. He's fighting at 147. Okay, cool. Yeah. 54. Cool. Like, that's it. Like, <coughs> don't even like in boxing, there's so many weights. Just people and people lose interest. That's it. Well, you know, and the, the thing with weight classes that people need to figure out the UFC only uses some of the weight classes that are under the unified rules. Yeah, they don't use atom weight, which is a normally it can be, a, you know, there's there's men that can be atom weight, I guess, but normally it's the women that you see there because it's 105 pounds. You don't see a whole lot of guys walking around at 105 pounds. But you also have super heavyweight. You know, everyone looks at hey, the heavyweight champion at 265. Well, there is a super heavyweight division. No thanks. They just don't use it. You know, the UFC looks and says, we don't use it because we don't think there's anybody that's viable that we care about that could, you know, is athletic enough to make us want to have a super heavyweight. They could be athletic enough, but I don't want to watch them hug each other for five rounds if they fucking get tired in the first minute and a half. That's part of the whole thing. That's the issue. That's not, that's the athletic part I'm talking about. <clears throat> They're athletic for a minute and a half. And then after that, it becomes a total oh. snooze fest. Can you yeah. imagine watching... So. The f- I mean, I, I mean, I, I watch myself all the time for a minute and a half with fucking intense fury. Then after that, I'm done. You know. So can you imagine another twenty three and a half minutes you of that? You haven't reached. <laughs> you haven't reached that ninety second mark for fucking years. <laughs> oh, I mean. Okay, I do have another question here. Okay. Can I ask? Yeah. Yes, you can. Okay. Who are you for one sixty five and one seventy five? If it happened, who are your poster faces for those divisions? And if you need me to read off names, I've got I've got the rankings open. Well, I think the, I think the poster name the poster you know name that you're going to have in the one seventy five is still a guy named Leon Edwards. I think I'm not saying that Leon could not uh, make one sixty five. I think he'd just be much more comfortable. In the 175, I think it would be uh, the weight class that he would go to. He's tall, you know. He's close to six foot two, so I would think that Leon would end up being your guy up in that. Uh, if you're going to look at, uh, you know, the 165s, one of two, you know, a guy named Dustin Poirier or a guy named Justin Gaethje. You know, you could say that Makachev would could go there, and he could go. He would like to go to 165. Mm-hmm. I think that would make his life a whole lot easier, just as it would have been for Habib. But, you know, there's a lot of guys. You know, Oliveira is perfect at 155. Mm-hmm. Gaethje can make it all the time, but he could go up to 65. But I think Poirier, Poirier's got a big frame. I, mean, I know he fought at 145 for a while, but I don't know how he did that. He had to, he had to suck, you know, the marrow out of his bones to get there. But, you know, I think that Dustin Poirier would be a, a perfect person to put a 165 you know i i would agree with you i also think somebody would make a big surge if he was able to to if the weight class was there would be jalen turner he cuts a ton yeah. of weight yeah a ton of weight very he, very good point he's fast That's six foot three he's getting better yeah. he you know i he's he does slow down as the fight goes on i think because he does cut a lot of weight he's very sure. relaxed out there which keeps him which makes him look like he's not as tired but we saw in the Dan Hooker fight, he got tired. That yeah. was ex- that was because of the the pace that they were fighting. Because I think he cuts a lot of weight. Dan Hooker is also another one that cuts a ton of weight. 
He's a big, he's a he monster. Does, but he even too. went down to 145. Know, which was crazy. Which was crazy. crazy. Um, you know, who else is up in this division here? I mean, like an RDA. He's another guy. He's gone from 55 to 70. He's back and forth, up yeah. and down, up and down. But 65 would be perfect for him. Yep. Um, there's plenty of guys in there. I mean, obviously, I think Islam could do what he want. You know, he'd, stay, he'd probably go to 65 because he's he'll get he'll get one more win, probably at 55, maybe two. But I think he was going to try to challenge himself anyways and going up to 70. But why when you can collect, when you can capture another title at 165? I just wanted to point this out. What makes what Dana does or what makes the UFC in the weight classes and MMA to be a two division champ or a three division champ, which has never been done before, is that because it's not so easy to do? It's because there's 10 pounds between each weight class. When someone in boxing does two, three weight class, I'm a three division champ, I'm a four division champ. We're all like, okay, cool. That's every yeah, six I'm four, pounds. I'm a four division champ within 12 pounds. Yeah. I'm just like, okay. It doesn't make, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything for the sport anymore. That's what makes it so special for us to say, hey, Connor was, DC was, you know, uh, you know, it's like, it's something special to talk about because it is so difficult. It's not the same. That's yeah. what makes, that's what separates this sport from, from boxing. It's a big deal. It's a really big deal. So, uh, I do like that they add the 65 if they do it. Um, I think Islam would end up being the face of 65, and I think some of the other guys would capture the title at 55. Um, and I don't know how many of them would go to 75. Sorry, 75. Uh, I think that would make for Shavkat would probably make the cut a little bit easier. Uh, Leon, I think, could fluctuate. I think Leon could make 65. What about, what about you know, guy named Jemayev? Yeah. Yeah, Chamayev could. Yeah, I think he could make seventy five. He could probably make it not easily, but he. I think he'd be a lot more consistent with it. Yeah, I think he would go to seventy five and be seventy five pound champ. Probably he'd have a he'd have a good answer for it with the wrestling pedigree. So One seventy has always kind of predominantly been owned by wrestlers, from Matt yeah. Hughes. You know, GSP was a stand up guy, but man, that guy could wrestle. That guy yeah. could wrestle. Oh, you know? Look through throughout. You know, if you're gonna go and look at George. When he beat, he beat Matt Hughes to get the title mm-hmm. the first time, you know, and then he lost it right away to Matt Serra. Mm-hmm. You know, he got hit with a big shot, got hurt. Matt Serra finishes him. And from that point, George St. Pierre's wrestling got better and better, and he just mm-hmm. took people down. And he kept himself out of danger, and he was – he used a great uh, stand-up mixed with his wrestling to make his wrestling even better. Yeah. I mean, but that weight class has always been dominated by that. Yeah, Pat Militich first, yeah, correct? Pat Militich, yeah. I mean, look, Dave wants me to ask you guys because <clears throat> he's sending me Texas. Like, I need to ask you guys, who would you guys like to see as the poster, you know, the, the face of that division, though? Would it be Islam at 165? Would it be Justin Gaethje, Dustin Poirier? Would you like to see Islam stay at 55? Or would you have him come up to 65? Who would be your guy at 175? Just Chemayev, that's a great, I didn't even think about that. Has Chemayev come down? to 75 who else in the 85 pound division because you know you kelvin goslam's gonna stay at 75 he'll go to 75 who comes down from the 85s though to go to, to 175 could be robert whitaker could be robert whitaker thought it was a 70 at one time yeah. you know um you know there's guys in here brandon allen i know he's a kind of a decent sized guy but he's got he still has some he's not as lean as most guys he's not muscular you know he's he's got a, he's got a good build he might be able to make the weight I'm just looking at guys real quick off of here. Um, you know, no, I won't say Paul Craig. Uh, no. <laughs> you know, but Chamayev is definitely is Chris Curtis could could probably definitely make 175. Shorter in stature, got some power. Uh, you know, there's there's just names up in here that I think could could definitely do it. You know, uh, last thing uh, last thing I want to talk. So that we've kind of exhausted the 165 to 175. Um, from I'm going to go back to last show just real quick, and I want to touch on it. John, we got a lot of flack for not giving Imovov the credit he deserved in the win. And I wanted to touch base. I'm like, yo, I did give him a lot of credit. I thought he looked clean. He did a great job. There was not, there's not much to say. I felt like he did everything he was supposed to do. It was Delice that I felt like I, was, I had to kind of ride on. Be like, hey, you haven't gotten better. That's one. Two is you have a tendency to dip your head to the right. Three is you are, you're kind of now, it's, it's, the how to beat you is laid out there is 
Don't let you get me into the clinch. Don't let don't let, don't let you bully me around and put you on your back foot and make you fight my fight. Now that's easier said than done. We know that. But Imovov had a great game plan. And stylistically, he is a bad matchup. His technique is so good. He doesn't leave himself out of position. Uh, he's very quick with his counters. He's a great fighter. I, I can't I can't yeah, give the guy any more credit than just telling him like, hey, he made it look easy. I thought he made it look easy. Now, people were ragging on us, too, about, like, we didn't criticize the judging. The judging was very awkward and weird. That's the whole thing was weird about it was because of the... Um, the fight was weird, and that's the whole point. Yeah. And that's that's that was the whole point with... Like, I I, I love Imovov as a fighter. I think he's technically... He, dude, he is clean, and he's good. He allowed Delice to make it that grimy fight, and he allowed Delice at times to stay where he was at when Imovov had the opportunity to break away. Imovov would get the underhook off of Delice, get the clinch. He would dig for the underhook. He'd get it almost every time, but then he would stay there. Instead of, you know, use that underhook to turn and get himself out. Now go back to that stand-up that you're killing him with, mm -hmm. but he wouldn't do it. And he would, time would go by in the fight, and that's what made it to be where you're you're putting yourself in a position to lose a fight that you should never lose. Yeah. You're cuz you're allowing this guy to stay in there. And no matter what, when you're allowing that guy to stay in there, dangerous things can happen to you based upon just one thing happening. And that and that was nothing against Imovov as, you know, he, like he fought a good fight. I had him winning the fight. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I thought that he allowed Delice to stay in the fight mm -hmm. at times when, and and I'm not I'm not talking about the first round. The first round he tried to get rid mm -hmm. of him. It was after that he allowed him to stay in these positions because I think he was worried about getting tired. He put so, so much energy out gotta, in that first round. Out. Oh yeah, no doubt about it's it. It's not easy. Like people think that oh I I just almost knocked the guy out and the guy had to weather the storm. I should be able to finish him in the second and the third. No, you've exhausted all your energy and trying to get that person out of there. Your back feels heavy. Your shoulders feel heavy. Your hands, like just trying to lift your hands up, your back and your shoulders and your neck just feel like they're just dragging. Nothing's yeah. coming out clean. Like you can't pop your shots like you were in the first round. The timing is way off. What and happens? As soon, as soon as you start to feel like you're, you're, you're standing in mud or you're standing, you're put your, you're, you're throwing your hand out and it just feels like it's not getting out there. Like you, normally ex, you know expected to you start to go whoa I, I gotta i gotta slow down yeah because you don't want to get countered that's the other thing like, you don't want to get countered and the second thing is when you start seeing fighters miss with their shots like they weren't hitting clean it's because their timing is off they see it and they're trying to react but their body's not doing it because they're tired and then it, when you miss it starts making you more tired it believe it or not it makes you more tired to miss a shot than it does to land it and so it just, it becomes exhausting. And then also starts becoming a mind fuck on you. It's because you're like, man, I'm not, I'm not hitting them like I was. And oh, if I leave myself out of position, I'm going to get countered. I'm going to get hit. I'm going to get dropped. It, I don't think you guys as fans understand how a mental warfare is going on in that fighter's head the whole time they're fighting. It's not with the opponent. It's with themselves. It's with themselves. He's fighting himself and they're going, okay, I can do this. Okay, I can do that. I see this. I see that. Oh, I I'm, oh, I've missed it. It's too late. I, you're battling with yourself. Okay, shoot. Oh fuck. He still he switches stance. Can't shoot here. Okay. How do I say? It's so many things that goes through his mind or her mind, and it all has to be done in a split second. So when you're at home passing judgment from your couch, all right, just think about that. That guy is having a war in between his ears. He's battling mentally for himself. Like, how can I get this done? Why is it not working? Or how come I'm missing? So think about the fight in his, try to think about it in his perspective and like what he's going through at that moment. Don't just say, ah, I would have fucking hit him. I would have knocked him out right there. Shit. I would have just jumped guillotine. God, fight would have been over. Stop doing that and start, start putting yourself in their shoes. Like, oh man, be a fatigued. Next time you want to watch a fight, jump on the treadmill. Just, just <laughs> go out. This is the, I, I tell people all the time, hey, just go and just run on a treadmill for four minutes, okay, and then jump off of the treadmill 
and for one minute, as hard as you can, start throwing shots and just in a bag down on the ground, just go after it with everything you have, elbows and punches, and just try to kill it. And then we're going to give you a minute break, and I want you to tell me how you feel. And you feel like shit. Yep. And then, then we'll add 20,000 fans in there cheering your name or not cheering your name. Lactic as you're acid out, and sets in, and it's like, in. oh my. You know, the, 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 the most, the, the perfect example of that was when Shane Carwin, you know, strong guy, big puncher, faced Brock Lesnar. And look, he threw everything he had at Brock. And he had Brock in trouble. You know, he just wasn't able to land the shot that put Brock in that yeah. position where Josh Rosenthal was going to stop the fight. And at the end of that first round, what do you think was it was going on in Shane Carwin's head? I'm done. He was like, I'm done. He's like, get I me the fuck move. out. He was, he was doing the Mike Van Ars deal. I'm quitting right here on this <laughs> duel. <laughs> He's like, just throw in the towel. Just but throw in the you, towel. You know what? If you've ever been, you, you understand. It, dude. It's not an easy thing to sit there and say, oh, I'm going back out. It's tough because you can, you know, I can't lift my arms. I'm exhausted, you know, and, you know, he went back out there. Yeah, Brock beat him in it, but he went back out there. It's a tough position to be in. John, I had some fights, uh, you know, the UFC back when they first signed me, they didn't have a lot of shows. So you had to wait if you, if I got injured, which I did a lot early in my yeah. career, um, you had to wait a long time to fight and again because the next two cards were full they already had the card laid out and there wasn't 15 fights on the card there was like nine or ten you know there was there wasn't a lot of fights on the card there was five main card and there was like five prelims and that was it yep. they had ten fights yep. normally <clears throat> and um and it just i remember having to take fights in between i fought rob mccullough the wfa and Joe's like, hey, if you fucking lose this fight, we're cutting you. <laughs> but I had to take the fight because I had no money, man. I had no money. I had to pay rent. I had to do all these things. And so uh, it ended up being a good thing. But it, it's one of those things that weighs on your mind as a fighter. Like, shit, man, if I lose this fight, I could be out. Uh. But I remember taking a fight up in Idaho during the time because they paid me a lot of money against this kid that was tough. But I went in. I wasn't in the best of shape. But they offered me the fight and I had like three weeks, I think, to get, I was training every day, but I had three weeks to, to kind of get myself in shape. But I remember in the third round, I'm like, this guy's still here. And I was, I was dominating the fight. First two rounds was a very dominant performance, but I could just, I could tell that he could tell that I was tired. And so he was, it made him feel fresher that he was, yeah, that he was better. able to stay with someone that was, you know, was signed by the UFC. It was it, or, you know, and fought, da, 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 like. But I had to get fights in. So I took this fight on short notice. And fuck, man, I remember how exhausted I was in that third round. I just got the easy takedown. And once it was there, I was like, just small little elbows. I was doing the Sean Shirk. Just, <laughs> I was like, just that just was it. To keep it there. I was like, no way. Um, all right, guys. Hey, that's going to wrap up our show for today. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, John, buddy, take us away, man. Hey, for everyone out there that is uh, complaining, good. Keep complaining. We love it. And we hope you listen in some more. For everyone out there, thank you for listening and take care. We'll see you in the comments. 